It's been about a month since I launched. Oops, forgot my duck. I have so many of these. For anyone who hates that I hold the duck, put them all right here. Okay. No, no, I can't do that. You're gonna have to go over here. It's been about a month since I launched my app and we just hit a huge milestone. We have 100 paying users and that's about $1,000 in monthly recurring revenue. This is by far the fastest any of my apps have grown. It's been crazy to see and if you wanna see all the past work to get here, check out the past videos below. But we're just getting started and there's still a ton of work to do. In this video, I'm gonna show you all the things that I've been building to keep that momentum going. And I'm gonna be honest about the biggest problem that I'm facing right now. If you're new here, welcome to the video. My name is Chris and I build productivity apps. I usually focus on one productivity app per video, and today we're focusing on my newest app, Amy. Quick context, Amy is a calorie tracking app in the style of Apple Notes. You just type what you ate on the left, and on the right, the calories will magically appear. I've been working on this app for about two and a half months now, and I've shared everything on this channel. In the last video, we talked about the tweaks I made to the paywall, the onboarding, all the things to try to get people to start a trial. But to be honest, that's only a fraction of the problem. The bigger issue is retention, which really means how many people after signing up are sticking with the app one week later. That's the number that I care about, and to be honest, it's not looking great, we're sitting at about an 8% week one retention rate, which means that if 100 people start a trial, only eight of them are sticking around one week later. So that's the biggest problem I'm trying to solve right now. No amount of marketing is going to fix this because if I can't get people to stick with the app, there's no point in getting these downloads. So how do you fix this? Unfortunately, there's no secret trick. You really just have to talk to users, figure out why they're leaving, and then build things to make sure that they stay. For me, the best places of feedback are a feedback board that I have set up so people can leave feedback and then upvote the things that they want to see in the app. Feedback from comments and DMs on social media because I'm posting about this everywhere. So there's a lot of feedback rolling in. And then people also reach out directly through email. These last two channels are very important because if someone is taking the time to give you direct feedback, that means that this is a problem that's very important to them. So I take it very seriously. I was looking at all the requests, trying to figure out, okay, what can I build to try to move the needle on retention? And the first feature I started working on, which kept popping up even during the development of the app is, can you add the ability to log food by taking a picture? To be honest, I have been seriously avoiding building this feature because there are thousands of calorie tracking apps that are take a photo of your food and we're going to scan it with AI and get the calories. I really didn't want people to think that it was just another one of those apps. But the feedback has kept coming up over and over again and I just could not ignore it anymore. And to be honest, after using the app for a bit, it makes a lot of sense. Even myself, I'm noticing when I'm at a restaurant, there are instances where it would be really nice if I can just take a picture of the food right there. Especially if it's something that has a lot of ingredients that are visible in a photo. So I built a quick prototype. It took about an hour to build and I was honestly very surprised surprise at how good it came out. So now when you open the app, there is a new button that signals you can take a picture of your food. When you click it, it's gonna ask you if you wanna take a photo, do you wanna upload a photo? It's actually pretty simple. We're gonna take the photo and try to make a very accurate description of what we see. And then we're gonna populate it into Amy as if the user typed it. And it actually is pretty good. Like check this out. When I took a picture of this sashimi platter, it correctly identified how many pieces of sashimi and what type of sashimi it was. I even fed in this picture, which I was pretty confident it would not be able to get. It was a half eaten dish and I was so surprised that it got it correctly. It even identified and broke down the ingredients for me. And here was a really cool example of me using it. It actually identified that I was given the wrong order. I am not making this up. I ordered a chicken sandwich at a restaurant and when I took a photo, it identified it as tuna. And I was like, okay, well, I guess it got it wrong. Then I started eating it and realized, wait a minute, this is actually tuna. The restaurant gave me the wrong order. So that was kind of crazy that it correctly identified that even when me looking at it, I I was pretty sure that this was chicken. I mean, in hindsight, it didn't actually look like chicken, but I thought it was. So that was a really cool magic moment where it actually was better than me at identifying the food. And the AI model I'm using to identify the food is Gemini 2.5 Flash Lite, which is probably gonna be surprising to people. It's actually very accurate, and more importantly, it's super fast and cheap. Each photo I'm uploading is costing me like a fraction of a penny. I thought this was gonna be pretty expensive to run, but this is actually pretty doable. I think a reason too is that a lot of the heavy lifting is still being done by Perplexity Sonar. So when we take a photo, Gemini 2.5 flashlight is gonna identify what's in the photo, but it's not gonna do anything else. It's just gonna make a description for us. Then we're sending this to Perplexity Sonar, which is gonna do all the heavy lifting, do the research, find the calories, and all the cost is gonna be there. And I built it in a way where you can edit the description. So if Gemini got it wrong, you can make a quick alteration and say, hey, it is actually chicken, it's not tuna. Or you can edit a portion size or an ingredient that it got wrong. Optionally, you can also say what restaurant it's from, and we will use this in the 
complexity sonar call to try to get more accurate data from the restaurants themselves. I've been using this constantly over the last week and it is probably one of my favorite ways to input food now. And more importantly, in some cases, it is way more accurate than me typing it. I still type a lot of things, especially when it's not in front of me or if it's a simple restaurant like an In-N-Out burger with fries, I can just type that instead of taking the photo. But when there's a lot going on with the meal, it's so much easier to just snap the photo. My hope is that this makes the app easier, it reduces friction, which again is gonna hopefully reduce churn and improve our retention numbers. I'll be honest, I have a lot of regret here. This is one of those features that I kinda wish I shipped on day one. The next thing people kept asking for was the ability to add micronutrients to the app. Right now we can track macronutrients, so that's protein, carbs, and fats, but a lot of people were requesting the ability to track things like sugar and fiber. The thing is, almost every other calorie tracking app on Earth supports this, so if my app doesn't have it and they see that, they're immediately just not gonna use it. Adding this took a little bit longer than I expected because it just touches so much of the app. But now there's a new section in the settings where you can enable micronutrients and you can set targets for each one. And you don't have to enable them all. Like if you only wanna track sugar, you can just turn on sugar tracking. More importantly, I added this to the onboarding so it's very clear to users that Amy does support this feature. So here's something interesting that happened when I enabled this. I learned very quickly that I am consuming a lot of sugar. I drink a bunch of lattes and matcha things and I was not aware of how much sugar is in some of these things, which was a really cool moment for me because that means that the app taught me something about my own nutrition that I was not aware of. It was a magic moment, and when you're building an app, these magic moments that surprise users those are the moments that you want to try to recreate. Now I'm interested in adding more features like this that are educational to show users this is how much sugar you should be consuming, this is how much fiber you should be consuming. But what originally started as a feature to just make sure I don't lose users actually ended up opening the door to a bunch of new features that I'm probably gonna add. These kind of moments build trust and trust is what gets users to stick around with your app. By the way, the photo tracking feature and the micronutrients were very easy to ship. I think it took like less than a day to ship both of these combined. And it's because I'm using tools like Claude Code and Cursor to move 10 times faster. If you look at my prompts, they're pretty detailed, and the way I achieve that is by dictating everything. I get a lot of questions asking what am I using for dictation, and the answer is Whisperflow. And a huge shout out to them for being a channel sponsor. Whisperflow is smart voice to text that works in any app. The reason Whisperflow is perfect for developers is it understands technical terminology. So when I say something like use state, convex schema, webhook handler, it gets it right every single time. And if you're using it with Cursor or Windsurf, Whisperflow has integrations with these IDEs. And it can actually understand what's going on in the code you're looking at and tag files. So check this out. If I'm inside Cursor and I say, please enhance the styles from subscription-overview.tsx, it will actually tag the file without me having to type anything on the keyboard. It's available on desktops, so if you're using it inside of Cursor, Cloud Code, or ChatGPT like I do, it's there, but you can also use it on iOS as well. I use it all the time, especially when I'm responding to messages on iMessage or Slack. I'll leave a link in the description. There is a code for one month free, and that's on top of the 14 days you already get of Flow Pro when you sign up. They did not have to do that. I'm the one that asked for the discount code, so a huge thank you to them for providing that. So back to the changes that I was making to improve retention. This last one is a bit more of a behind the scenes improvement, but I think it really does matter for the user experience. And it's improvements I made to the actual calorie calculation of the app. Let me explain how it originally worked. I'm using one AI model for everything and that's Perplexity Sonar. So whenever you add food, it's going to send the request to Perplexity Sonar, which is gonna run a web search, pull in different pieces of data from different websites, and it's gonna take everything, calculate the calories, and return it back to the user. We do the exact same thing when a user makes an edit. So if they edit the same exact line, we're going to send that to Perplexity Sonar, it's gonna do all its stuff, and then it's gonna return turn back updated nutrition information. The problem is not every edit requires a whole expensive internet search. Let's say you log a burrito and you're very happy with the calories and then you wanna just change the portion size. So you just write half of a burrito. You would probably expect it to basically half all the nutrition info. But unfortunately what's happening is when you do that, it's going to send a request of perplexity and it could accidentally pull completely different sources for the burrito and you're going to get back a number that is not half of a burrito. It's probably gonna be a little bit off which happened to a ton of users. I got a lot of reports about this. It was very confusing for people because when you tell it to give you half of a number and it doesn't return that, you start losing trust in its ability to actually be accurate. So I rebuilt the whole system and instead of just using one perplexity sonar model, we now use multiple models. The way it works is now when a user edit comes in, we actually first check what was edited and we use a very lightweight cheap model, Gemini 2.5 flash light, to first check what type of edit was made. Are we just editing the portion or is it an edit 
edit that requires a whole internet search to do. And it's smart, so if it sees that the change mentions half or 2x or a couple of bytes, any natural language, it's smart enough to detect that that is just a portion change. And if it's just a portion change, we're going to send it to Gemini 2.5 Flash. It's gonna accurately change the portion sizes, the total calories, the little thought process section that's in the app, all of that's gonna be updated by 2.5 Flash. It's super fast and very predictable. Now, if it sees that it's more than a portion change and it needs to actually do a web search, then it's gonna call Perplexity to do that update. This technique is super common in AI systems where you first classify the request with a cheap model and then send it to another model depending on what's being requested. But this makes a very big difference. And there are three main benefits that I got by doing this. The first is that it actually does what the user is expecting. So if they wanna change the portion, it's going to now accurately change the portion. Number two is it is much faster. The Perplexity sonar calls do take a few seconds to run because it's doing a full web search. For Gemini 2.5 Flash, it'll now take less than a second in some cases to return the response. And then number three is it is way cheaper for me to run. The perplexity costs are about almost one cent per edit. So that means every time someone was making an edit, that was costing me one cent. Gemini Flash is like a 10th of that. So, so much cheaper to make these edits than it was before. I knew I would have to rebuild the system eventually because it made no sense to send everything to perplexity sonar. For the sake of speed and getting it out there, I shipped it as is. But the time has now come to build this multi-AI system because it was actually impacting quality in this case. Now that it's better at following these instructions and it's faster, I think that's going to build a lot of user trust, which again is going to really impact retention. So those are some of the big things I shipped in the last week to try to improve retention. We're at 8% week one retention, so I'm going to be monitoring this number closely and my North Star is to try to get it to something like 30 or 40%. It's going to take a lot of work, but I'm very excited to see what kind of impact it has on the app. The app's already looking pretty good, so I'm excited to see what it's going to look like in a couple weeks. In the background, I'm also doing some research on UGC. So that's a channel I'm very excited to start exploring. But while we're doing that, I need to focus on improving retention because again, if we get the downloads, there's no point if we can't get the users to stick with the app. So I'm gonna keep talking to users, iterate based on their feedback, and hopefully we can bump that number up. Hopefully this was interesting. If you like this kind of content, check out my Instagram and TikTok. I post almost every other day about building productivity apps. And obviously if you like this content, don't forget to subscribe. But thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.